The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 2. God, what is that? Pepper almost retched. Now they could all smell it. Jesus, it was bad, and it was coming in through the windows. The downside of letting the breeze into the van was that it also paved the way for every shit-kicking, rat-infested stink that just happened to be hanging in the air. Erin gagged and pulled her head back inside. Not that that helped much. God, that smell, it was awful. Sweet, bad, moldy, like shit, like, like, hard to explain. Just some kind of bad stink that hit you hard in the face. It somehow shocked you. The smell physically shocked you. It crawled its way up your nose like a warm vapor trail of suffocating puke shit, then suddenly kicked you, making your head rock back and your guts turn inside out. Before you knew it, you wanted to throw up. They were all suffering, but Kemper seemed least affected. Sure, he sniffed a bit and moved uncomfortably in his seat, but he kept his hands on the wheel where they belonged and didn't make a big fuss. That's because he'd smelt this shit before. Slaughterhouse. He said. Immediately, everyone understood. The van was heavy with the stench of death. Not just one death, but a mass production line of deliberate, scheduled, calculated disembowelment and destruction. The reduction of life to death, of production to consumption, meat processing, meat packing, hygiene, sanitized, regulated, stainless and scalders, conveyors, spine pickers, cutting boards, shackle line washers, salvage stations, old-fashioned meat hooks, and state-of-the-art cool rooms. The ultimate symbol of evolution. Language, science, and technology culminating in mastery of the food chain, forcing birth, creating life solely to die. They don't understand. They don't feel a thing. They're not afraid. Herded in at one end, shrink-wrapped at the other. Pumping the cattle with hormones and antibiotics, then taking a new Maddox stunner to their meat bastard heads. Broken bones and bleeding joints. Cows ingesting carcass toxins, burgers sold with plastic toys and a smile. Human remains, the very definition of hell. The killing fields of Cambodia, Ed Gein of Wisconsin. Now here, a reconstruction of Ilse Kalk's Buchenwald played out on four legs. Where man has the right to kill because two legs stand closer to God where man has the right to kill because he alone has hands capable of holding knives. Aaron looked out and could see the buildings of the meat packing plant just off the side of the road. Before she even saw the slaughterhouse, the stench had reminded her of something. Now that she knew where the smell was coming from, her memory came creeping back. It smells like a dead cat. She heaved. Not just any cat, the cat she had in mind was the one she'd found lying on the sidewalk when she was just a dumb kid. The orange tomcat had been hit by a car. One side of its head was crushed and Erin had cried for days. Her mom had tried to help by telling her all about animal heaven, but if this shit-smelling slaughterhouse was anything to judge, animal heaven must be pretty fucking full up right now. Well, if we fired up another joint... Offered Morgan, holding his nose. It wouldn't smell so bad. It wasn't like Morgan to somehow try to use marijuana to solve each and every little problem in his life. Much.
The van was past the slaughterhouse, and Erin was quickly losing sight of the hundreds of cows she saw crushed together under the low roofs of the massive holding pens. As the van moved on, Andy and Pepper got up and knelt on the back seat to turn and look through the rear window. They couldn't take their eyes off the place. It was like nothing either of them had ever seen before. The girl's jaw dropped. For once, she wasn't smiling. So that's what it looked like, the slaughterhouse, the building where stuff got killed. Ugh, how could people work in a place like that? She wondered aloud. I mean, think of all those poor sweet cows. To hell with the cows. Andy cut in like she hadn't a clue. Try breathing those fumes all day for minimum wage. That's mean. She scowled and she made sure that when they sat back down, there was some distance between the two of them which gave Morgan the opportunity he needed to butt right in. Ducking his head out of the way of the bobbing piñata, he got up off the beanbag and leaned forward, pushing squarely in between the hot and cold lovers, driving a physical wedge through their personal space. Then he looked back through the rear window at the distant slaughterhouse. It was hard to tell if he was genuine or not when... With a look of total seriousness, he said, It takes a special breed to do that kind of work, cutting cows' throats and bashing out their brains for a living. Perhaps he was speaking a little too loudly to be sincere, or it could have been the dope. Either way, Pepper was too upset to listen. Stop! She complained. Everything was about death all of a sudden. Dead animals and their sickening, putrefying stench of death. Now Morgan was talking about butchers like they were murderers or something. But Andy thought his skinny friend had made a reasonable point, even if he was wrong again. Those dudes get used to it pretty quick. Andy corrected. No, they don't. Countered Morgan. Most don't last a year. The others just stay drunk or go insane. Great. First death, now insanity. Pepper looked straight at Morgan through the lenses of his glasses and right into his eyes. A change had come over the van. Some kind of anti-party cloud had descended, and she didn't like it at all. It was a bright, sunny day, not a midnight campfire freakathon. Morgan's the expert on the stupidest shit, said Kemper. He realigned the rear view and could see the confusion on Pepper's face. He wanted to lighten the mood again, but having said that, as far as Kemper was concerned... Morgan was an expert on the stupidest shit. Aaron, however, was interested in where all this conviction was suddenly coming from. One minute, Morgan spaced out on his beanbag. The next, he's some kind of brainiac in the shit-morbid art of meat processing. How do you know so much about it? Aaron asked. I'm vegan. Morgan replied, taking everyone by surprise. It's my job to know these things. This one sentence worked an incredible magic on Pepper. Her eyes lit up beneath her wavy brown hair, and suddenly she was gift-wrapping her smiles for Morgan, and Morgan only. So cool! She gasped, beaming. We have so much in common. I don't need anything that can smile either. You did last night. Commented Andy with a wry grin. Ugh, you are so crude. She fired back. Andy was bragging, showing off that she'd tasted him yesterday, only now he was using their fun to insult her. Pepper still found Andy's muscles and his sweaty gray wife beater a turn on, and she knew he was only messing with her, but Andy was rapidly becoming Mr. Old News, while his friend, the Beanpole from Beanbag City, was quickly transforming into Mr. Deep, even though his hair was pretty fucked up. He didn't eat animals, and Pepper liked that. She couldn't help but look on admiringly as Morgan drunkenly staggered back in the direction of his beanbag. Wow, he'd got totally shit-faced on weed. Maybe she look should- Look out! The van swerved. What the- It was Aaron who had cried out, warning Kemper of something in the road, and now the van was all over the place. Andy grabbed hold of the back seat and braced himself. He'd seen it all. A young woman, a teenager, had been walking aimlessly down the side of the road. She looked like she was lost or delirious or something. The moment she'd heard the van approach, she'd stepped right out in front of the vehicle. There was no way Kemper could. Acting solely on instinct, the mechanic cut the steering wheel, darting the van over onto the shoulder of the highway. 
The moment the A-100 hit the bumpy surface, it started skidding, and Kemper had to fight for control. Oh, shit! Morgan never reached the beanbag. As the van lurched to the left, he fell forward and accidentally caught the pinata with his hand, knocking it down to the floor where it cracked open. Meanwhile, Pepper had grabbed hold of Andy and was praying to God that everything would be all right. She looked out the window and watched as the meandering teenage girl rushed by in a blur, the van barely missing her. Was the stupid fool trying to get herself killed or what? What was she doing in the middle of the fucking road? And how come Kemper, or Aaron for that matter, only saw the blonde girl at the last second? She couldn't have just come out of nowhere. You can see for miles along these roads. Maybe hitching with these guys wasn't such a good idea after all. Kemper grappled with the wheel, trying to set his baby straight and back up on the road. There were times when the van's awesome power could be a real pain in the ass, and now was one of them. He had to jam both feet on the brakes to get a reaction, and then had to steer into the skid to bring the van safely to a halt. Silence. The emergency stop had kicked up a cloud of dust around the vehicle. What the hell? Sighed Kemper. You almost hit her! Shouted Pepper from the back. But Andy thought she was beating up on the wrong person. What the hell is she doing walking in the middle of the road? He rapped. It was a miracle that Kemper hadn't splattered the dumb bitch's brains all over the front of the vehicle. Where was she now? Still shaken, the whole group climbed back to look out through the rear window. Who was this girl? What was she doing? Kemper didn't think he had hit her. He certainly didn't feel any impact, but maybe the side of the van had clipped her or something. Aaron came up last behind Kemper. As she climbed back, she caught sight of the broken piñata. It was packed solid with marijuana. Now she got it. Kemper's eyes had been glued to the rear view ever since their return from Mexico, and all along she thought he'd been taking in Pepper. Aaron should have known better. Yeah, she took some comfort from the fact that her guy wasn't being a pervert, but she was still pretty pissed off that he was always going behind her back like this. And what if they'd been caught at the border? Seeing her reaction to the dope-filled paper mache container, Andy nervously reached out and slid the split pinata under the back seat. But he was wasting his time. Aaron was pissed that everyone in the van seemed to be in on the deal except her. Did Pepper... The hitcher? No. She wasn't even one of the gang. Aaron looked to where Kemper stood by the rear window and could only bring herself to say one terse word. Asshole. Her comment was loud and clear, but the asshole in question didn't seem to notice. He was too busy staring out back at the girl he'd almost just killed. It was clear now that the girl was a teenager, but it was hard to work out her age. Was she a smooth-talking 20 or a rough-looking 16? At first, when she'd rushed out into the road, she'd look like a tall kid, maybe because of her knee-high summer dress. But now, her face. What the hell does she think she's doing? Snapped Kemper. They were going to Dallas. Skin nerd, remember? But now, everything was going out of joint, goddammit. I think she needs help. Said Pepper, which Aaron totally bought into. She prodded Kemper and sent him back in the direction of the driving seat, then joined Pepper to peer out through the glass, the two of them having to squint in the bright sunlight. Kemper got back behind the wheel of the van and turned the ignition. Everyone else continued to watch the girl as she carried on walking away from the vehicle. She was a mess. Her hair was disheveled. Her pale sundress was dirty and frayed. The skin on her arms and shoulders was bruised and scratched. Her flat shoes were worn and filthy, their soles blistered by the hot skillet surface of the sun-beaten highway. It occurred to Aaron that the girl might have been in an automobile accident, maybe further along the highway towards Dallas. The girl looked terrible, but the strangest thing was the way she just kept on walking, walking away with her back to the van, as if the whole incident of her nearly being run over had never happened. Slowly, Kemper turned the van around and headed back along the highway. Morgan sighed. Why the hell hadn't Kemper stayed on Interstate 35 like everyone said? Scenic route bullshit. Now they were going back, chasing some fruitcake at less than five miles an hour. At this rate, they'd be back in Laredo within the month. 
Soon they'd caught up with her. The van drove slowly alongside her, the chrome rims revolving in time with her dual walking pace. And now that they were close, Aaron could see the girl's eyes. They were dead. Are you okay? Called Aaron through her window. No response. The girl's face was impassive, vacant as she took one step after another, marching painfully along the highway that would lead her to nothing but more and more wasteland. Immediate panic over and done with, Morgan dropped down onto the back seat. Boys, that's a bad acid trip walking right there. Andy nodded in agreement, but Aaron went right back at them. Or maybe she was raped, you dipshits. Typical of Morgan to bring everything down to drugs. He could be such a fucking moron sometimes. The van continued to roll forward beside the zombie-like girl. She paid no one any attention. The van didn't exist. Aaron and Morgan could have argued for hours, days, and still the girl wouldn't have noticed. You're gonna get yourself killed? Tried Pepper, anything to break through. But nothing. Hello? Called Aaron louder. Can you hear us? Aaron was pretty pissed that Andy and Morgan weren't trying to help. At least Kemper was helping with the driving. And then she saw it. A teardrop. Just there, caught in the sunlight. A single teardrop was rolling down the young woman's cheek. Even when Aaron had first seen the terrible state the girl was in, she'd known that something was very wrong. And now the girl was quietly crying to herself, and Morgan's big idea was that the poor kid was on a goddamn trip? Stop the van! Aaron demanded. Fuck that! We got a concert to go to! Morgan replied. And we're still three hours from Dallas. Chimed Andy. Damn bastards! Aaron looked forward at Kemper, but he'd already got to thinking. They'd make Dallas in three hours only if he broke every speed limit in the state of friggin' Texas. But he also knew better than to argue with Aaron when she had that look on her face. Aaron had made up her mind, which meant she had made up all their minds. The brakes squealed as the van rolled to a gentle halt. Kemper made a mental note to check the wheels when they got back. Probably picked up some dust from that brief excursion off-road. Aaron and Pepper opened the side door and hurried out onto the road. Jesus fucking Christ, on a cracker it was hot. And there she was, the girl with her filthy summer dress, her arms, neck, shoulder, and legs all burning in the midday heat. And her skin, God, she was covered in marks. Pepper reached out to help when suddenly the girl spun around. She looked deranged. She'd changed from expressionless a few seconds ago to wide-eyed and crazy. Aaron couldn't tell if the girl's wild expression was one of anger or fear, but something about the side of her resonated with Aaron. She made Aaron remember something. No, not remember. She made Aaron see something. The girl was familiar. Aaron looked at her watch. They'd been on the road how long? What day was it? Was this happening today or... Tomorrow, shit, the heat was confusing Aaron. It almost felt as if someone had just walked over her cremated ashes. No, there was no time for this shit. Aaron tried to take the girl's hand. God, gotta get away, recoiled the shivering derelict, her eyes darting feverishly in all directions, looking, searching, almost as if expecting something to happen. Inspired by the sudden breakthrough, Aaron asked her who she was trying to get away from. The girl looked at Aaron with her long hair, clean skin, her face concerned. Then she looked at Pepper, about the same age as the wandering girl herself, dressed pretty, a real person. Aaron and Pepper were both people, real people, girls like her. The girl tried. She tried to. She wanted. She... I want to go home, she whispered, her whole body beginning to sag as if under the weight of a colossal release of tension. Her voice was hoarse, as if she'd been shouting or screaming, and there was dried snot between her nose and upper lip. Do you live around here? asked Pepper, hopefully. No response. The girl had finally stopped walking, but now she seemed in danger of simply stopping altogether. Somehow, God knows how, Aaron and Pepper had connected with the teenager. 
but this only seemed to have unlocked something, and now the girl was uncoiling to the point of collapse. Aaron and Pepper looked at each other and silently agreed that the girl needed help. We can't just leave her here, Aaron called back. Andy shook his head and stared down at his feet. Morgan was back on his beanbag, staring off into another dimension. Only Kemper seemed to be paying any attention, and even he was scratching his goatee, which usually meant he was in the process of deciding whether or not something, something or someone was pissing him off. Well, tough shit. Aaron carefully reached out to the girl. Let us help you. And soon she and Pepper had the girl sitting on the back seat of the aerosol gray Dodge. Time to move. Kemper started the engine, slowly turned the van around, and then they were on their way again. Morgan remained slovenly decked out on the beanbag, while the others gave the girl plenty of room. Andy and Pepper kept well back while Aaron looked around from her place in the front passenger seat. All four of them, five if you included Kemper, through the rear view, couldn't take their eyes off their new messed up passenger. She was disoriented, frightened, and filthy. Her movements were erratic and she would not give in to eye contact of any kind. Mostly, she stared down at her battered shoes, though Aaron guessed that what the girl was actually seeing was something miles away in the landscape of her traumatized memory. What's your name? Soothed the Aaron, only a year or two older than the girl, but feeling maternal all the same. California? Strange name. Are we going to California? I want to go home. Big problem, California was completely the wrong way, and in any event, the girl was in no fit state to travel. Her lips were cracked and dry. There were deep, dark rings under her eyes, and she was weak. She needed professional help. Oh, wow! Sang Morgan. Oh, I am way too stoned for this. By now, Pepper was beginning to think he was a complete jerk, and she usually didn't think ill of anybody. But Morgan's veggie credentials had long since faded. The guys had been only too quick to pick Pepper up whenever she was hitching, probably because they thought she was an easy lay. Andy, for one, had already jumped her. But when they came across someone in trouble, someone who needed their help, they didn't want to know. No sex with this crazy girl. Thank God Aaron had Kemper under some kind of control. Manage the driver and you've got a winning game plan. Aaron was taking the lead. Kemper, let's find a hospital. That was the best thing they could do. The girl needed professional care. But in case Aaron had forgotten, they were pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Give me even the vaguest idea where we can find one. Kemper sniped. And we'll go there. In passe. Until they heard the girl's voice. She was crying. They're... 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 They're all... They're all dead. Up front, Aaron and Kemper turned to look at one another both suddenly afraid. Then they turned their heads back in the direction of the girl and what she had just said. Pepper was freaked. Who? Oh. She asked, and she couldn't help but look out through the window. It was still the same day, the same bright, sunny morning. Nothing had changed outside, and there was nobody out there. <laughs> all the people, they're all dead wept the distraught girl wearily. What the hell was this? People? Dead? Dead people? Was she talking about an accident or a car crash, maybe? Or perhaps it was something to do with the weather or some other kind of accident or... Jesus, no. Morgan laughed, almost hysterical, like it was so damn funny that this beat-up girl, this girl in shock, was talking about people being killed. He looked over to Kemper and sniggered. <laughs> Did your mother ever tell you not to pick up hitchhikers? Aaron ignored him and focused on the girl. Though she was crying and scared, the girl looked real pretty. She still had some puppy fat on her face, and her blonde hair had last been cut by someone who really knew how to use a pair of scissors. God, what had gone so wrong for her? We're people, Aaron said, trying to reassure her. And we're not dead. But the girl wasn't listening. 
her attention had suddenly become focused toward the front of the van. She was trying to see out, over past Kemper's shoulder and through the windscreen. Aaron turned to follow her troubled gaze. There was nothing much to see, just an old wooden sign by the side of the road. The paint on the sign was faded and worn, but Aaron could quite easily read the dubious words of welcome. Fuller, Texas. Drive slow. See our city. Drive fast. See our sheriff. Fuller? Where the hell was that? But Aaron had no time to ponder this further, because behind her the girl became frantic. She'd seen the sign, and the twelve painted words had sent her into a flood of tormented tears. She gripped her head in her hands and bent forward in her seat, weeping. Morgan laughed nervously, and Andy didn't know just where to put his face. The day had taken a real bad turn. No! Welled the girl, her whole body juddering with anxiety. You're going the wrong way! You're going the wrong way! Aaron was just about to explain why they were going the right way. Yes, it was the wrong way for California, but the right way for Dallas and for getting the girl some help. She just needed to calm down, but the girl rushed up on her feet and dived to the front of the van. Then she reached forward and grabbed hold of the steering wheel. Kemper was caught by surprise. She was scratching the backs of his hands and pulling the van out of control. Holy shit, get her off! This was something Andy could deal with. There was no way he was going to let this crazy kid screw up their journey any more than it had been screwed already. But the van was already veering left and right before Andy could grab a hold of her and used his strong arms to pull her away from behind the driving seat. He didn't want to hurt her, but neither did he want the van to roll over. All the while, the girl fought with Andy and tried to break free. People are out there! People are out there! She sobbed. Still sitting on the beanbag, Morgan moved his feet out of Andy's way, then took out his packet of cigarette papers. If Janis Joplin was going to scream and holler all the way to Dallas, he had no intention of being straight enough to hear her. They're, wa they're watching, she cried. They're still watching. They're watching. Who were watching? Pepper looked left and right onto the plains, but could see nothing but grass and crops and trees. There was no one out there. No one. Andy carried the kicking girl, almost lifting her off her feet, before dropping her once more on the back seat. Can't make me go, go, she panted, but he was too strong for her. Aaron looked back concerned. She wanted to help. The girl was breaking her heart. I want to go home now, cried the girl. I won't, I won't, I won't go back. Back where? Shouted Andy. From where he was standing, she was just plain crazy. Suddenly, the girl weakened in his arms and dissolved in a flood of tears. Andy slowly, gently let go, ready to make his move if she ran forward again. He didn't have to worry. She had nothing left. Her energy was gone. Her willpower was in shreds. He's a bad, bad man, sobbed the girl, her whole body trembling. A very, very bad man. Andy took a step back. The girl looked safe. Then he glanced over at Morgan, who'd been about as useful through all of this as a left-handed hand job. The stoner smiled at Andy, then nodded over at the weeping girl and silently mouthed two words. Fucked up. Then he went back to rolling his joint. Up front, Kemper kept his foot on the gas and concentrated on the road. Some weird shit was playing out behind him in the back of his baby, and he didn't want anything to do with it. Best he could do was get them somewhere fast. Then they could offload Looney Tunes and continue on their sweet way to Dallas. they just passed a sign, the one that made the girl freak, so they must be coming into a town sometime soon. As long as his friends kept her away from him, along with her broken, scratching fingernails, he'd be just fine. He just hoped that Aaron was feeling damn satisfied with her Samaritan gig. Aaron herself was deeply worried. She didn't know what to do and was fast running out of ideas. They needed help. They... You're all gonna die! <laughs> wept the girl, her face abject, her eyes little more than two white beaten slits of despair. And then she pulled a handgun out from where it had been hidden inside her sundress. 
the gun was a revolver, a .357 snub nose, and just the sight of it scared the shit out of everyone. Even Morgan stopped what he was doing. Andy tensed for action. The girl had a gun. The bitch had a fucking gun. He knew he could take her. She was upset, crying. If he just kept his cool, he could... Pepper screamed and jumped back. The girl said they were all going to die. She was going to shoot them. They'd picked up some kind of psycho. If Kemper had just run her over in the first place, none of this shit would be happening. Only Aaron held it together. She began to get up out of the passenger seat and held a hand out to the girl to try to defuse the situation. No use. The girl raised the revolver and put the barrel inside of her own crying mouth. No! The girl's cheeks went sallow beneath the tear-filled hopelessness of her tortured eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no! Aaron could see the muscles tense on the girl's dirty, blood-stained trigger finger. Pepper, Andy, Morgan, they all looked on in total horror. They each knew that this was a pivotal moment. They were standing on the brink of something awful. The girl started to hyperventilate, her lips wrapped around the cold, deadly cylinder. She was sucking it. Kemper slammed on the brakes, his face pouring with sweat. He was saying something, but his words were all but lost in the rising hysteria from the back of the van. People were shouting, screaming, crying out, frightened for the girl, frightened for their own lives. It was a millisecond of chaos that lasted an eternity. Standing inside the windshield, the plastic hula girl jiggled and danced like she'd never done before. Each time Kemper went off-road, she wiggled. Each time he swerved the van, she swayed with her airbrush smile. And each time he hit the brake, she danced the fucking hula. Down back, the girl's fingers tightened on the trigger. <laughs> Blood splashed across the entire dashboard, spraying the hula girl with a warm spray of sticky, scarlet liquid, and goblets of gore. Blood splashed across the back of Kemper's head, soaking deep into his baseball cap. He turned. The interior of the van had become the color of mottled death, the spattering blood tracing a glistening arc up from the back seat to the front windscreen. Kemper's eyes swiftly followed the spray pattern, tracing its course past Morgan. Motionless, unharmed. Pepper, freaking but no bullet holes. Andy, helpless but safe. Aaron, God, Aaron sat beside him in the passenger seat, crying, spots of blood on her tied white tank top, alive, fine, thank Jesus God she was fine. And the girl, the teenage girl, she'd been afraid anyone could see that. She'd been in shock, she'd been injured, she'd been exhausted, her clothes were torn, she'd been hysterical. It looked like she'd been to hell and back, and now she lay there on the back seat of the van with a bullet through her brain. She'd shot herself through the mouth, the bullet exiting through the rear of her skull. As she died, her blood had splattered against the rear window, painting a deep circular smear on the glass a mere fraction of a second before the bullet had continued on its way and punched a jagged hole through the center of the pane. If the blood was the target's, the hole was its bullseye. It was a headshot. The girl had killed herself. Not the kind of crybaby stop me suicide, advertised weeks in advance with letters, aspirins, and phone calls. This was the real deal. No messing. No bullshit. Over and done with. Kemper managed to park the van inside an area of shade beneath a tall tree. Within the shade, all they could hear was the sound of Pepper screaming.
Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 2 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Again, great job to our cast of characters. Everybody's doing a great job. Uh, really enjoying this book. Um, I, 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 I wish I could get it out quicker. Uh, but like I said, I'm going to be able to do two uploads per week. Maybe on special occasions I can get a third one out uh, during a seven-day period. Uh, but I love Stephen Hand's writing. He really puts you into the scene. Even though we've seen it before in the movie, uh, he really puts you puts you there with the characters, gets you in their heads, and it's like you're sitting in the van with them during all of this craziness. Um, the hitchhiker blowing her brains out. I mean, that caught me off guard in the movie itself. Um, and in the book, I thought he handled it very well. Uh, even, even drug out their... Um, you know, them talking with her a little bit before she actually uh, did herself in. Um, I like how Stephen Hand mentioned it wasn't the fake kind, you know, the advertised weeks in advance. Uh, he actually made that comparison, which makes me think he's been in a, maybe in a situation in his life where he's dealt with suicide, like a lot of us probably have. I myself have had a really good friend uh, that did it, and, uh, you know, it, there was no warning, there was no no way of knowing it was coming. It just happened. So I totally understand what Stephen Hand was saying there. And uh, anybody listening to this, if you're ever having suicidal thoughts, please call the suicide hotline. Um, there's always somebody there to talk to. It's It really is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And uh, there's always going to be somebody that will listen, you know, hell, if you need someone to listen, I'm here, uh, larousse.exe at gmail.com, um, but yeah, guys, this, this, I really enjoyed this chapter, I'm looking forward to the rest of the book, and, uh, let me know what you guys thought of the chapter, and what you think of the book so far, what you think of Stephen Hand's writing, uh, the way he, uh, wrote out this scene, pretty hardcore scene, and did you notice the whole thing with Aaron, like like having like a deja vu moment, even though he didn't call it deja vu, um, with the girl that killed herself? Uh, where it made me think that maybe that deja vu was like her knowing that this was going to be her soon, just like a quick glimpse of it, you know, uh, seeing what 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 awaited her. Uh, that's that's something you can't do in a movie. You know, but you can do it with a book. Uh, get in the character's head. And that's an example of why I enjoy these novelizations so much. Because uh, we got in her head there. And we got a little bit of her deja vu feeling uh, before this, before what's going to happen to her and her friends happens. Uh, so yeah, I'll be back very soon, guys, as soon as I can with uh, the next chapter. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood, 80 Slasher Librarian, saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. And uh, I'll see you soon. And I've already gotten you guys twice with the jump scare, so don't worry. I'm not stupid, you know. I'm not going to try it for a third time. <laughs>